spreading. Yeah, and as well. Yep. And so, yeah, the mouse is ready to go. And what I'll just keep clicking. <laughs> now, how do I? I don't know where I put stuff around. Um, okay, now I want to get this out of the plane. This top bar. Shuck, shuck, shuck. I did it again. Okay. Right there. All right. I'm going to stop recording. We'll edit it. Okay. And how do I get rid of this bar? I don't. Okay. Sounds good. So all you have to do is click the left side of the clicker, and, I'll see. and it'll you'll see the next screen as you click. Can there. you make that the full screen? Oh, that's a big one. Yeah. Okay. And so go. I'll click it. I'll see. Very well. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, hello everybody. We're gonna start the lecture. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Thank you. Who's got a whistle? <laughs> if you do come up with an answer, you just have to admit that. And now, where would I All start? All right, thank you, everybody. Big uh, hit admit. Yep. Oh, there. Quite an adventure. Yep, this is our first Zoom. Certainly on our oh, first pandemic lecture. So. I'm happy everybody chose to come. When you're finished your lunch, you put your mask back on. That would probably be a good idea. Um, <laughs> what I'd like to do is start with a little housekeeping. First of all, uh, I wanted to tell you that these books, the 125, are in the blue room, blue box. And uh, after the lecture, if you've ordered one or want one, go to the blue box, and uh, they'll take care of you back there. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is couple enhancements to our dining venue at the club. Upstairs, the blue room has been completely redecorated. So if you have a chance, look at the blue room on your way out. It's really spectacular. Phoebe Dupre is the head of the Robin Stewart, Maggie Brown. I've been working for about six months to get it all re redone. It's spectacular. And the other venue is going to be out here in the courtyard. Um, we're going to make this a dining venue through February. Right now, it's got the heaters uh, and lights for the evening. Uh, so if you want to have lunch in the courtyard or dinner in the courtyard, um, I've heard it's quite nice, they all the heaters. And then later in October, when we put the ceiling, you know, that, that fabric uh, plastic thing we normally have on there, that'll be there. And again, it'll be available for eating and dining through February when the club closes. So it's now called the Palm Court, <laughs> for what it's worth. But, uh, Maggie Coleman's working on a whole new set of uh, plants to put out there to make it quite nice. So, um, so today um, we have our esteemed author, the best author we have in the club. <laughs> uh, he uh, has uh, written this book, and uh, if you haven't looked at it, it's spectacular. He's really done a super job. Uh, but he's also the author of uh, Three Seconds in Munich, um, and he's written that book. Uh, that we'll have him come back next month as the second lecturer uh, talking about the controversial 1972 Olympic basketball final. Quite a good book. Um, he's also written Lamar Hunt, the gentle giant who revolutionized, revolutionized uh, professional sports. So another, another great book. Um, you may know that he's uh, launched columns for the Wall Street Journal and NBC Sports. He's written for the Chicago Sun-Times, the Los Angeles Times, and other publications. But most importantly, he ran the Lake Forest, <laughs> which is one of the, one of the, <laughs> one of the and North Shore Research. So, so with that, David, you're on. He's going to sit down so we can zoom the camera here. But he said he'd project uh, to everybody. So David, you're on. Thank you, Judd, for that introduction. and. Uh, Thanks for getting the Friday lecture series back on track. And since the following talk is about history, as Jed mentioned, this is a historical occasion. It's the first virtual Friday lecture series. And uh, there are at least 30 people watching this on Zoom. 
Um, and I bet those who founded this Friday event, uh, they were called the and Romeo stood for retired old men eating out. And I guarantee you the founders of that could not imagine the technology uh, that is here today that we can have people not in this room watching us. Um, back then the Romeos, I mean the biggest uh, technology, the end all and be all was the fax machine. So uh, this is quite a bit different uh, to have this here. Uh, oh, thank you, George. We're still admitting people into Zoom. Uh, before I begin the presentation, uh, Peter Smith and the Board of Governors for allowing me to pursue this book and to uh, give me a free hand to create it as, as I wanted to. Um, and I think one of the important things to know is I thought uh, the key to this book is the past 25 years. Now, some people may say that's by default because we do have books on the first 50 years, the first 100 years. But I would argue the last 25 years is the most transformative quarter century in Alwensia history. And let's, uh, let's go back to 1995 for a moment. Everyone remembers Blockbuster Video, a very popular store. This was a huge thing back in 95. Cassette tapes, we all listen to music on cassette tapes. Uh, Sears was a major company. General Electric was a major company. Uh, Amazon was still known as a rainforest. Uh, the internet barely existed. Uh, Tiger Woods hadn't even turned pro yet. So I, I just wanted you to get a sense across the world how much has changed in the last 25 years. And then what was the club like then? Uh, we'll, we'll start with squash. Uh, we had two courts. And one was a North American singles court that was quickly becoming outdated. We also had a double court. We had no true squash pro. We had no real ladies program. Uh, we didn't really have a, much of a junior program either. Uh, to try to get a game together was not easy either. I mean, you call a friend on the phone and um, you, you know, and then you try again and the phone would ring and ring and the friend didn't have voicemail. So just trying to get a squash game together back then was just almost, uh, it was a lot harder than today, I'll put it that way. But then you fast forward to today. And uh, Aiden Harrison was hired in 2001. And uh, he was flipping through the book the other day. I gave it to him a couple of weeks ago just to give him a, a quick look. And he was both uh, pleasantly surprised and taken aback at how much focus I'd put on squash. Uh, but I mean, to me, that program has gone from, you know, a bottom level to a top level under his leadership. Uh, first of all, we doubled the number of courts. That was important. And the two singles courts became international, which is the standard now. Uh, added the doubles court as well. Um, Aiden became the first true squash pro in club history. Uh, Rod Workman was a pro, but he was uh, trained in tennis. So his, uh, he would admit his squash lessons weren't quite as good as Aiden's. Um, and under Aiden, the junior program has taken off. And to give you an example, uh, Porter Drake on his 13th birthday had his first squash lesson. And within six or seven years, Porter Drake was the captain of the University of Pennsylvania squash. Uh, and there are a number of examples of uh, children who went through Aiden's program and got scholarships through squash to top-notch colleges. Um, so the junior program has just really taken off. The ladies program, again, back in the 90s, wasn't much going on. Aiden made sure that uh, the ladies, um, you know, got, got something going. They, they play a lot of doubles uh, in the mornings, on the weekends. Uh, and two tournaments have been introduced in the last 25 years. Uh, the 50-50 for ladies, along with the Cyril Cup, which is the ladies championship. And those are always well attended and a lot of par participation in those. And then the men's, you know, the men's has always been pretty strong, but it got even better, uh, especially with pros to organize games via email, made things a lot easier. Um, and the men's 50 50, thanks, Jeff, uh, really took off. I mean, anyone who realizes how successful it's been back in the 90s, it was a handful of people. You might have a Pepsi and a sandwich afterward. 
Uh, these days, it's just, uh, you know, you have great things like a red card, a green card during the matches. John Dick came up with those ideas to make it more creative. Uh, you have the fault theory uh, and the pin man serving drinks at the end of the, or at the 50-50 finals. Uh, and you just have great competition. Uh, it's amazing how many matches go to the final point to a blood ball, and that's because the handicaps uh, are so well structured. Uh, I should also say, too, uh, the men's club championship has become a lot more popular. Uh, unfortunately, Jeff Dupre passed away, as we all know, but uh, thankfully, the Dupre family has endowed the club championship in his memory, and those have been incredibly strong in the, uh, in the last 20, 25 years. And I have to mention the Hunter family, who has endowed the 50-50. We've had uh, Sunday Sundays, Bloody Mary bars, uh, fried oyster Fridays. I mean, they've made it just such a great event for players and spectators alike. Uh, so, you know, thankfully they were so generous in, in what they've done. And Bill Hunter, I, I don't want to forget you, you should be in this photo. I, I didn't Photoshop you out or anything, but Bill, Bill Hunter gets, gets uh, to be mentioned as well. Uh, and then there are just other items during this last 25 years of squash that are incredible. Uh, we've had the World Championship doubles tournament here, and no chance back in 1995 anyone would have thought that could happen. We've had world number one players give clinics here, uh, and the list goes on. So again, this, uh, what, what has happened with the squash program has just been fantastic. Uh, these are, as the words say, junior tennis sensations. Uh, Rod Workman told me from about 1995 to 2005, we had some of the best young players the club has ever seen. And at one point, 18 of the top 30 players in the Chicago area were from on Lincoln, junior players. And you think about that, it's amazing. They're from a country club, uh, which, you know, we emphasize sportsmanship fair play and everything, that we had these great competitive athletes who uh, really dominated the Chicago sports scene. But also, I mean, we do have some amazing senior players. And here's one of them sitting right here. <laughs> I, I often see Hugh on Saturdays. He plays a lot of tennis still. Uh, he's, a legend on the squash court as well. He's won a number of 50-50s. Uh, so I definitely wanted to uh, get a picture of him in the book. And it, for those who see the book, and Hugh, I don't know if you've seen it yet, uh, Hugh's grandfather, or sorry, Hugh's granddaughter, uh, Sophia, is on the previous page. So the generations continue to play. Uh, paddle tennis, we added a third paddle court. Uh, we created a new paddle hut. Uh, some of you remember the old one was between the two courts. Uh, now it's part of the Rackets house and it's a lot nicer. Um, and the big news though is we had an one, we have a lot of great players, but one amazing player during the past 25 years. Uh, Brian Uline won two men's national doubles championships. Uh, as well, he, as it says, became a member of the Hall of Fame in paddle tennis a couple of years ago. Uh, so he, he really took the paddle tennis world by storm. Uh, during his uh, during his play the last 25 years or so. Now golf, uh, Hubby Habjan. If I'm looking at the last 25 years, which I am, Hubby didn't have much of a role. He had he was only there for about a year. But what what a career he had. Uh, Hubby made clubs. That's a lot of his success was through club making. And a lot of pros you've all heard of bought clubs from Hubby, Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicholas, Lee Trevino. Um, and because of Hubby, he could get those same pros to the uh, Children's Memorial Tournament. And back in the late 60s and the 70s, I mean, it was so much fun to see those guys playing here. Uh, they would play at the Western Open and Hubby would persuade them to play the following Monday here at Don Wensia. Uh, and Hubby, he was a vice president of the PGA. Uh, he played in a British Open, played in three PGA championships. 
had a great run here. Uh, and this photo is with Hubby, his, his predecessor, George Smith. And between them, they ran the program for about 66 years, which uh, is <laughs> absolutely incredible uh, for two pros. Bruce Carson came in after Hubby, and, and Randy Lyon told me that during the interview, he asked Bruce, you know, are you a good player? And Bruce said, oh, I, I used to play quite a bit. I'm not that good now. And then Randy played with him out here, and Bruce shot uh, par the first time playing the court. So he was obviously still pretty good. Um, and one thing that struck me about Bruce's tenure uh, was, that was just incredible was the fact when he started here, there was no golf course to be played. Uh, the course is being renovated under the Tom Doak renovation. So, uh, I, and I should mention a little bit about that renovation because it was a great one. Um, it improved the greens quite a bit, the sand traps. We added new tees. Um, and one thing that we added that a lot of us don't like, I, I definitely don't, is the prairie grass. Uh, that, it, so many people have lost balls in the prairie grass. And, and during my research, I found out that when the course opened back in 1998 or reopened, uh, the head of the golf committee said, people looking for balls in the prairie grass should only take 30 seconds. And this summer, I've seen people take five minutes trying to find balls there. And even when they find them, they can't hit them. Um, but Bruce Carson, uh, so his first year of the pro, again, didn't have, didn't, uh, didn't have a course to work with. So he made reservations were on Wednesday members to play at Shore Acres and other courses. Uh, he worked on the golf shop. Um, in Hubby's day, there wasn't a lot of branded merchandise. Hubby was really focused on uh, making golf clubs. So Bruce added some uh, you know, new merchandise there. He was very important for the junior golf program under, in Hubby's era, uh, Hubby wasn't a fan of junior golfers so much. Uh, <laughs> I think everyone knows that. Uh, but Bruce really took him under his wing and you'd have to basically take a test if you were a junior golfer to prove you knew how to rake the sand trap, uh, when to pull out a flag stick, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so the juniors went out, out onto the course with a lot of knowledge. Um, and Bruce introduced the nine wine and dine. Uh, he just, he, you know, had a very good run here uh, and was very well liked. He was a real gentleman. Uh, then after Bruce, we have someone we all know, Nick. And we did a search around the world and we found him two miles away. He was at Old Elm. And uh, Nick's done a great job here. He introduced the McDonald's Cup, which uh, a lot of players enjoy. That's a Thursday evening tournament, nine hole matches. Uh, he put in a golf simulator up in, uh, in that area near his office. Uh, which has been incredibly popular. Before this year, that was the only place at Alencia that ever had tea times, but that changed uh, this summer when we had tea times here. Uh, he's launched a lot of great trips to Scotland, and uh, he's just been you know, a positive influence all the way around. Uh, this summer, we received uh, our oldest trophy in our vast collection. This is from the Lake Forest Club, uh, the, the precursor to Alencia. The Lake Forest Club, for those of you who don't know, is at the day school. Uh, it was a nine-hole golf course. And uh, it's, it's great to have uh, this trophy in our collection. We also got uh, the 1906 U.S. Open replica trophy, uh, which is very important this summer. Um, and I should also mention, in the last 25 years, we've had a head of the USGA, Buzz Taylor, uh, the Pierponts gave the club two teepees that have been out near the 13th hole. And uh, the list goes on. It's been a great quarter century in the, uh, in the golf program. We've had uh, two new sports introduced since 1995. Croquet is one. Uh, Sandy Stewart gets some credit there for spearheading this. Sandy uh, played at a club in Houston and uh, really enjoyed the game. And one of the things that uh, he liked was uh, older generations could play with younger generations. Uh, and his example was he saw a 95-year-old woman and a much younger partner win a, a tournament. And we sort of have that going here. James Kristoff uh, won 
the Stewart Cup this year. He's 16 years old. Uh, it, so it really shows you uh, you don't have to be in the prime of life to, to play croquet. It's a very social game. Uh, Rod Workman has pointed out there's always a bar nearby. Um, and uh, there's a good chance the court will be expanded in the next year or two, and, and that, that's good news as well. Um, pickleball came in a few years ago. I, I, was, I ventured back in 1995. If ever, anyone had mentioned the word pickleball, they'd probably be laughing. It just, it just doesn't sound like a, a country club sport, but it, it is. It's really taken off here. Um, we have a, a courts today that are on the northernmost tennis courts on the east side, right near Green Bay Road. Uh, Aiden and Modic have done a great job getting people interested in this game. It, it's a hit in Florida for those of you who go down there, which is pretty much why uh, we ended up bringing it here as well. Backgammon has taken off. Uh, in the last 25 years. Now, the McLaughlin Cup uh, was actually introduced in the 1970s in honor of Peter McLaughlin, who passed away. Uh, on the screen is his daughter, Cindy, and his, his wife, Jerry. Uh, so they had two uh, tournaments back then for the McLaughlin Cup. But then uh, Jeff Cushman, um, who is Cindy's uh, husband, and Peter Dunn really got it rejuvenated, uh, I'd say maybe eight years ago or so. And now it's one of the most popular participation uh, events in the club. You get about 80 plus people every year playing it. Uh, and just like croquet, it's very nice because you, you meet people of all ages and you meet people you wouldn't have met otherwise, most likely. I've heard that story many times. Um, and along with uh, the McLaughlin Cup, we've had uh, junior backgammon. Rod Workman has uh, brought that program to new, to, or, the heights because they're not new heights because there really wasn't one beforehand. Uh, the Shirley Shootout is a popular tournament that's named after Rod's mother. Uh, we have 10 boards here. I mean, back in the day, we might have had one. So there's just a lot of backgammon going on at the club. Um, that, and that's been a huge positive. Now, this guy won the tournament in uh, a couple of years ago. In, and my main point is you can dress any way you like for the club finals. And <laughs> hopefully if I'm ever in the club finals, I'll be able to borrow that. But, uh, <laughs> but that was Jamie Kane against Mike Rhodes. Um, again, backgammon can be a lot of fun. It's just an enjoyable game for all of us. Uh, the pool changed uh, in the last 25 years, not as much as other areas of the club, but we renovated the pool. Uh, we now have steps sort of under the water, so it's easier to get in and out of the pool. The pool patio uh, was also re refurbished and is a very popular dining spot now. Uh, and it's funny, one of the girls in this photo, I, I was showing the book to Dan Sibley, a squash pro, along with Aiden, as I mentioned, and Dan was going through the book, and next to him was one of the girls in this photo, and she was so excited that she was in the photo. And uh, I asked her, you know, do you still play hide the seed? And she said, yeah, it's still a really popular game. It's one I played way back in the 70s. and it was always so much fun. And in the book, Miriam Kristoff has some great memories of playing uh, that game with her uh, sister, Carolyn, and Laura Freed. Now we move to sort of the dining and entertainment part, um, along with imbibing. So back in 95, we still had the hamburger shack. A lot of you may remember that. Uh, you know, screened in area, it served hamburgers, hot dogs, milkshakes, not much else. Uh, it was only for lunch, not dinner. And it was, it was a popular spot. I mean, kids would run over from the pool and grab something quickly, but it wasn't the nicest spot, I would say. Uh, and then we brought in the wigwam. And that has been such a huge hit. Uh, looking back, if we had had the foresight, but it was impossible to have to know how popular it would be. We might have built a bigger kitchen or, you know, expanded it somewhat. Um, but the wigwam has dinner, unlike the hamburger shack. shack. It uh, serves alcohol, unlike the shack did. And it's really been a, a huge success um, over the years. To 
the blue bar uh, that uh, came in like that, I don't know, eight to 10 years ago, roughly, I may be wrong on the exact date, but that's been a big hit. Uh, at first, it was a little controversial. Uh, there was, that was an area a lot of women love to play bridge in, and some people would have lunch there. Uh, but it's been so popular for people to go in, have a drink in a great atmosphere, and then move upstairs and have dinner. Uh, Austin Dupre uh, had a big hand in making it look as, as elegant as it does. Uh, Austin also was heavily involved with uh, the North and South Shore that, that also uh, were refurbished in the past uh, 25 years. And there, you know, there's really too much uh, in, in depth. I'll just sort of highlight some of the other changes. Uh, we had a, introduced a new summer member program. A lot of those members have become full-time members. Uh, women joined the Board of Governors. Uh, the eve of the eve started, and that's, as everyone knows, gets, I, I think, 400 or so people every December 23rd. And the backyard barbecue started a few years back, and that got 400 plus people, even though it was started on a Sunday. So uh, again, I would just argue this has been a truly amazing quarter century at the club. And it's hard to realize unless you sort of look at it from that perspective. It's hard to remember every detail unless, like I was able to do, you sort of start looking back at uh, everything that has occurred in five years. So aside from focusing on this quarter century, I also wanted to focus on people. Uh, I found um, among the club books I've, I've looked at, they're often sort of stiff and formal. Uh, they may show you a beautiful room, but you don't get a sense of the day-to-day -day activity of the club. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that, um, you know, a lot of these people at Alencia were, you know, were recognized. Um, and, and I just mean, you know, the joy of playing in the pool, the joy of having a party uh, at the club. Uh, the fun of uh, you know playing pickleball, whatever it might be, I wanted to get as many members in as possible, along with aside from their photos, to interview them and talk, you know, share their stories and their their uh, memories, and so forth. Oh, sorry, that was the slide that was supposed to be on. And then I wanted to talk about the staff. Uh, I was here this morning uh, taking a croquet lesson from Rod Workman, the director of fun. And I'm rarely here at this time of day, and it was rainy out, and hardly any members, if any, besides me. But there's so much going on. The staff is putting together the croquet tournament that's going on tomorrow, the first visitors' croquet tournament. Uh, they're working on uh, the children's memorial event, the lorry uh, that's going on tomorrow as well. I mean, the club was a bustle of activities, but but it was all the staff working hard to make sure the membership can enjoy what happens here. And what one uh, thing I wish I'd been able to do uh, was interview Alex Berkman. He, as you know, had been here 40 years before he had health issues, but no doubt he had so many amazing stories. Um, but I also, am, you know, I think we're all just so happy that on one team members came through to help Alex so much. He, he you know, we just were there for him. Uh, in terms of helping him with his health care. And I should also note, Wade Miller was just out, you know, ex extraordinary work on behalf of Alex, helping him get in the best shape he could get after, after what happened to him. Uh, the staff has also helped in sort of promoting this book on Wednesday at 125 uh, and, and helping me research it. Um, I remember cold January mornings being up stairs in Wade's office and he'd pull out uh, you know minutes from the early 1900s or from the Great Depression and uh, he was always so generous with his time and he'd show me some old photos as well. Uh, Aidan Harrison put together a great video of the book if you hadn't had a chance to see that it came out a, a week ago in an email but maybe we'll put it up on the website because it was really well done and then I'd like to thank uh, Julie Deicher who uh, helped me put together this PowerPoint. I've never done a PowerPoint before today, and she was uh, really helpful in just sort of uh, getting the photos in there and so forth. Uh, so thank you to Julie. Now, the first 100 years of my 
my focus was trying to get the most in-depth, detailed history on golf that we've ever had. Uh, we, we have such an amazing history. You obviously you wouldn't know it looking around the club. We're very subdued about it. Uh, uh, you know, I've been over to Exmoor. They have display cabinets with trophies. And uh, unless you read this book or read our previous books, you wouldn't have a sense of our illustrious golf history. Uh, we had the 1899 U.S. Amateur here, and back then the Amateur was more important than the U.S. Open. Uh, that was because the U.S. Open was considered, they just considered the players a bunch of drunks and sort of scoundrels maybe, but the Amateur was played by gentlemen. Uh, and we had, we had one of the first Amateurs, you know, probably one of the first three or four in the country, so that's, that's amazing. Then uh, three of our members, played in the 1904 Olympics in St. Louis for golf. And that Olympics, I mean, it was another 112 years before golf was in the Olympics after St. Louis. So in golf history, that was a major Olympics. Um, and three won gold medals. Uh, Mason Phelps was one of them. And you talk about the connections and the generations and the history. Mason Phelps was uh, Marion Pollock's father, as well as Rob Douglas's grandfather, and they're both members here today. Um, so we have a photo in the book of his gold medal and of Mason himself. Uh, the 1906 U.S. Open, uh, does anyone know who this is on the screen? It's the winner, uh, Alex Smith, um, who uh, probably the most interesting guy to, to our group he beat out was Willie Anderson. Willie Anderson was a teaching pro here. And he won three U.S. Open, but at his home course, he couldn't win it. Alex Smith took the honors. Uh, we've also had some great players. Robert Gardner and Edith Cummings are two. Uh, Edith won the 1923 U.S. Women's Amateur. And she also became a character in the book, The Great Gatsby. Uh, we had two USGA heads during that first 100 years, uh, George Blossom and John Ames. George Blossom came up with the idea of the USGA Museum. And today, uh, Hillary Cronheim, who grew up here at Amnesia, is running the USGA Museum. So there's a great connection uh, that way. People have asked, uh, you know, how, how did you put the book together? And I, I've given you a little hint from what I've said all, already, but it was sort of two years of enjoyable work interviewing people, researching, uh, writing, editing, hiring photographers, picking the photos, thinking about a design, uh, and so on. Uh, there, are, there are, you know, a number of decisions to be made. Uh, one of them was what type of paper stock should we use? And I think we got an excellent uh, quality, elegant paper stock. Uh, and then should we have a dust jacket on the book? And I took Guggen Bunn's advice on this. Guggen, uh, who has a large collection of club books, said, if you put a dust jacket on, it just tears, and then the book doesn't look as nice. Uh, so we, I decided, Guggen's right. Uh, no use putting one on. And uh, I give Guggen credit, too. I, I never knew what the word quatsqui centennial meant. I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing it right. But it means 125th anniversary. And that, that's what we're celebrating. <laughs> Uh, the last six weeks before publication were sort of a whirl of fact checking and rereading and rereading. I, I just want to uh, make sure I got it as right as much as possible. I, I'd email Joe Byers and say, Joe, was it your great uncle who won the 1906 U U.S. Amateur? And he'd say, yes, it was. Um, and I, you know, I checked, let's say, a woman in 1940. Her name was Frances from the USGA, I did see whether Francis was an I or was an E. So I just was going over this over and over again. Uh, and then the board was helpful. Um, John Ward, uh, he saw that I had written Walter Hogan instead of Walter Hagen. Uh, ben Hogan would have been fine, but Walter Hogan doesn't work. Uh, Carl Jenkins identified a few photos for me that I, I hadn't known he was in. Uh, I even made a stop the presses decision because I had misspelled the last name of Frederick Law Hempstead. Some of you know him as the uh, architect of New York Central Park, but he's also 
he had landscaped uh, Henry Ives Cobb's um, grounds here, and we bought Henry Ives Cobb's 170 acre, 175 acre farm from him to turn this into Ron Lencia. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about photographers. Um, Jim Prishian, he's an excellent Chicago Tribune sports photographer. Uh, he was with them during the Michael Jordan era. So I had him come out and take pictures of people playing golf, pickleball, but you know, get, get some good sports shots. And then uh, Jan Salazar was recommended to me by Peter Smith. And she took a lot of the social shots, uh, some of the pool shots, uh, and she was great as well. But we were really, uh, we lucked out because our golf superintendent, uh, Scott Vincent, who has you know, created a beautiful, beautifully maintained golf course, is also an incredible photographer. He, he, uh, his photos grace the cover, the back cover, the first few pages as you open the book, one of the last pages as well. Um, I, you know, space constraints, I couldn't put as many photos of his as I wanted to in the, into the book, but I just wanted to share with you his uh, talent, um, these photos that he's taken at different times uh, on the golf course that, you know, really, uh, he's just, if, you, if you've never seen his full selection, you should ask him because it's just really amazing. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank John Swift and his, uh, his team at Swift Printing because uh, John made this book a priority and uh, he worked with me as, as often as I wanted to go into his plant uh, to talk to him and, and the designer about it. Uh, it was his suggestion to have the paper stock we do. And, uh, you know, if you, anyone who thinks print is dead should go to the printing plant out in Buffalo, Buffalo Grove. I mean, the printing presses are just running, you know, nonstop with newspapers, magazines, books, all, all sorts of stuff. And uh, what were the most interesting, or what was the most interesting discovery, people have asked. And it's on the screen now. So we, for probably at least 120, maybe 125 years, it said we're a C.B. McDonald's port. And in all the research that I did, I found that's not the case. Uh, C.B. McDonald, in fact, in his own book called Scotland's Gift Ball, took no credit for Ron Lencia. He gave his son-in-law, H.J. Wiggum, full credit for designing the course. Uh, and if you look at the course, he, uh, many of you know, C.B. McDonald, uh, created the Chicago Golf Club course. And the way he did it on the front nine was to accommodate his slice. So out of bounds was to the left and to the right, he had plenty of space to hit his shot. This nine at Alwencia uh, was originally now, was 10, is now 10 to 18, but that was originally the first nine. Every shot C.V. McDonald hit would have gone out of bounds. So it doesn't make any sense that, that he would set up the course that way. As well, there are other attributes of Valencia that are not C.B. McDonald attributes. Uh, there's also talk that maybe Robert Paulus had a hand in the design, and that makes sense. He was our first pro. Um, and so anyway, uh, I would, to me, this is one of the bigger items to find out. Uh, I, I really do not think C.B. had a hand in it, although I, I should definitely point out the seven hole course at the lake, the first course in Lake Forest, he did that where tomato cans were buried in the grass. He also did the nine hole course with Robert Fowlis at uh, Lake Forest Golf Club. So, uh, and, you know, we're not unique in sort of rewriting what we thought. Uh, the old Elm Club did the same thing a number of years ago. They had already, always said it was a Donald Ross course, and now they through research, found out it's really more of a Harry Polk course, and Donald Ross was involved, but not, not the main guy. Another interesting item I found, uh, the Onwensia Cup, which we created, obviously, uh, does not reside here. Now, why would that be? Uh, Chandler Egan won the Onwensia Cup three times, and by tradition, he got to keep it. And Chandler Egan was an Exmoor member, and at this point, it, the Alwensia Cup is in an Exmoor display case, which is pretty ironic to me. <laughs> so, 
And I'd like to finish by thinking and having all of you think about what will the next 25 years hold? Uh, for those of you who will be in this room in 2045, you know, what, what kind of changes will there be? Uh, you know, we have land to the south of the 18th hole. Uh, what will happen to that? Will there be a winter wigwam? Uh, we had a number of presentations on that uh, six months ago. Will there be a new sport or new sports? Uh, who knows if maybe we'll have a court tennis court here, one of them that'll only be about the 12th in the country. It's just, it's just almost impossible to say, but it's, uh, you know, it's always fun to think about because again, back in 1995, a lot of these changes, no one would have predicted. But uh, as I wrote in my final words for the book, I, I think the only guarantee is this, and I'll read them here. Uh, drink in hand, adults will still sink into the white Adirondack chairs off the West Terrace. Kids will still play around the streams of water pouring into the pool, and the clubhouse will still enchant whomever walks into its majestic space. So thank you for being here for the historic event, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so we'll ask questions here and then uh, then we'll turn to the people on the Zoom call and we'll let them come in for questions. So, fire away. Thank you. And then how do we do the Zoom question? So, if you're on the Zoom call, unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question and uh, fire away. Just ask to unmute. Should I click that? Oh, click that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, try it. Any questions via Zoom? We're getting there. Yeah. <laughs> and will they be able to be heard? Yeah. So again, anyone on Zoom have any questions? Yes. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. That's great. That's good to know. They look very happy having uh, dinner up there. That that one? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm glad I put that in there. I didn't know those were your parents. I don't, I don't know if All we right, well, have any questions here. Uh, the book, Oops. pick one up on your way out. And thank you very much. You'll be back in October for another another lecture on the Olympics. So come back again in October. <laughs> thank you. David had it.